Thank you all for coming. Um, if anyone was at the talk upstairs with Chris, who's over there, and Sole, who I don't know if is here, uh, they did a fantastic talk, I have to say. And that's really the bit after my talk. So think of my talk as the prequel, and there's is the sequel. Sequel, yeah, sequel. Anyway, and there'll be a lot of sequel in this as well, <laughs> or a fair amount. So, so, creating data pipelines in Python. Data, data, data. I feel like we're always talking about data, so let's maybe not talk about data for a bit. Let's try and think about what it was like in 1431. 1431, what a different time that was. And this is Britain in 1431. This is a map from around that period to try to get as close as possible. Uh, up here you can see London is here and Dorset, some other areas. So that's what Britain looked like uh, at Pangaea. And in 1431, there was a merchant by the name of John Beer. John Beer um, would travel from Southampton, or from Hampshire, sorry, to London uh, and buy and sell goods. Uh, I'd set up his stall on market day and sell his goods. John would buy cheese and quicklime from Hampshire and sell it in London. So on market day, he sets up his stall and the first customer arrives. And, uh, so, and the customer asks, oh, is that a bit of cheese from Hampshire? And, uh, and then John's like, yes, it is cheese from Hampshire. Oh, and the customer says, oh, I'd, I'd love some cheese from Hampshire. Now, John had bought a, a pound of cheese in Hampshire for 15 pence. And so the customer says, how much is the cheese here? How much is your cheese for one pound? And John says, uh, 10 pence. So cheese they bought for fifth, one pound of cheese in Hampshire was 15 pence and 10 pence for a pound in London. So the customer's like, oh, I'm going to have that cheese, great. And John um, uh, sells the cheese. And both the customer and John are happy with that transaction. They exchange money and exchange goods, and off they go. After a while, a builder comes and says, oh, is that quicklime? Um, quicklime is used for construction. Is that quicklime? And John goes, yes. And Hampshire is known for its quicklime. Not really. I'm not, not quite sure about that. This is just an idea. Um, it, it's known for its quicklime. And uh, asked John, how much is a quicklime? Now, there they use back in 1431, a unit volume was called a quarter. And John had bought a quarter of quicklime in Hampshire for 90 pence. And he said to the customer, I'll sell you a quarter of quicklime for 15 pence. So uh, the builder says, oh, that's a very good deal. I like this quicklime. I can make a, a house or whatever he's going to do with it. And they exchange the goods for money once more. So uh, my question for you is, um, why were both parties in both those transactions happy? Yeah, sorry. Exactly. They weren't standardized. It's very quick. In 1431, a pound was not the same in Hampshire as it was in London. A quarter, so a pound, by the way, back then it was called a pondus, uh, but there were different types of measurement systems in 1431. Um, a quarter was different in Hampshire than it was in London. You might think, why, am I, why is he speaking about medieval history and stuff like that? But it will tie in very well as we progress throughout this journey. So let's talk a bit more about what did John do? What did he have to do to sell his product? So at, in Hampshire, he had to understand the measurement system that was there, the quality of the goods that he was buying, uh, the, any, what the different vendors and how they worked, what the price of the goods was and the local currency in that area, uh, what language and dialects he had that exist in Hampshire. Maybe there were some specifics in that language that he should know. Um, how was he going to... So we already said currency. How is he going to store those goods in what kind of warehouse? What were the laws and religious customs of that area in 1431 to buy some goods? So now he has to transport it to London. What does he have to think about when he's transporting? What, where, which roads is he going to take? Are there some roads that don't need tolls, some do need tolls? Is there better 
Is there better infrastructure on some toll? Does he need a cart or a wagon? Does he need security? In 1431, there are a number of bandits who would attack merchants and take their goods. Um, what packaging was he going to use for his goods when he was transporting it from his source to his destination? And then he arrives in London. He has to do many of the same things again, right? To understand what the measurement system was like there so he could communicate to the seller what the quality of the goods were and what kind of competition he'd have, what the prices were, or what the language, dialects, currencies, were there any levies on, on, in the Guild Hall in London, which is or near around there, that he had to pay, or what the laws, and religious customs, etc., etc. That's very complicated, very complicated just to sell a bit of cheese and a bit, bit of quicklime. He needs to know all of that, and they're quite separate. Well, they have some crossover, but he needs to know both those things just to sell that. So, so the problem is standardization. In 1431, and around that period, what they tended to do was they used to go deeper into quality than they used to scale vertically than horizontally further into quality than having more goods. That was easier for him to do. If he improved the quality of his cheese or the quality of his climb, he could uh, generate a larger profit from that rather than maintaining all of this. So standardization is the, is the answer to this problem. Um, and I'm just going to go through the history of standardization in Britain. In 959, there was an ordinance by King Edgar to standardize money or was an attempt to do so, at least. In 1215, there was the Magna Carta, and it attempted to standardize uh, weights and length. In 1824, was one of the biggest changes in Britain was the Weights and Measures Act um, to try and standardize many things. However, I'd like to read out a little transcript from a newspaper in the top right-hand corner. Um, for there are still in use 25 local corn weights and measures, 12 different bushels, 13 different pounds, 10 different stone, and 9 different uh, tons. That's insane. Like, uh, uh, absolutely insane. After the Second World War, uh, how, I, I, I sometimes think about this, how did, uh, how did the quartermaster get all the goods from around Britain to be able to conduct a war? It's a very difficult process to be able to do that. Uh, I need this, for, this amount from you, that amount from you, that amount from you, and then pull it together. It's, it's a hard thing to do. So why is, why is this important? Uh, this is really uh, the data engineer's problem. It's very similar to the data engineer's problem. Let's see what a data engineer really has to do. So data actually, if you're getting data from different sources, it comes from a variety of different sources. Databases, FTP sites, APIs, three file shares, HTML for web scraping, etc. Uh, the formats might come in JSON, XML, HTML, CSV, ORC, WAV, and it, and it goes on and on and on and on. There may be many different types of compression algorithms that exist. Dot .zip, dot .tar, dot .gz, .gz, and they all, actually you all have to work with them in a different way. Using .gz in a distributed system is very good. Dot .zip and tar .gz you can't compress, at least I've not been able to, in a distributed computing environment. I can't compress that in Spark. It has to go into one node. If my .zip file is really big, I can't distribute that across. It has to move the data to one node and has to uncompress un un it. Um, but you get all these problems when you're trying to get data, and data vendors are giving you data. So, and it becomes uh, a cross-joint problem, right? And it becomes very complicated. How do I, how can I, I don't want to make custom pipelines for every single one of my vendors. I, I, a data warehouse should have uh, a large volume of data and a large variety of data. If I go to a, the, the modern, par par oh, sorry. The, the modern par paradigm of a library is a data warehouse. Back in the old day, uh, back, let's say, for example, the Library of Alexandria was an area where information about the whole empire used to come and accumulate, and you would go there to learn about what you could do and what you could create. A uh, database or a warehouse is where you go these days to find out what products you can have, what's going on uh, around your business empire or externally. 
So then you want to get your data into your relational database. That's typically what you want to do, right? Uh, Two-dimensional. So you're taking it from a multi-dimensional format to a two-dimensional format. So you can consume it, join it, query it, do what you want. But it's not even that, uh, just that simple because you have different types of databases. You might have an analytic co analytical column store. You have schema on reads, et cetera, et cetera. What do you do? How can I standardize the process from getting from my source to my destination as a data engineer? So... Simple is better than complex. Um, I don't know, who knows where that's from? Zen of Python, Zen of Python. Thank you, Chris. Um, so let's try and work from these, this problem. Let's build up, understand the problem, build it up, try and do something simple, but it might turn a bit complicated, but let's try not go down the complicated route. So uh, we have our source system, uh, and this is where we're gonna do our work. And this is our data warehouse where data will typically be consumed by our consumer. And this is a data lake. Who here doesn't know what a data lake is? Please show of hands. Hands, I'll, I'll describe it very quickly. Some people don't know. Okay, quick, I'll be very quick. A data lake is a place, uh, S3, for example, is a data lake. You have uh, cloud storage is another one, HDFS. These are locations where you can put in data as files or folders and consume that data using an API. It's better than uh, a file folder system on your computer because many people can access it and it has an infinite size that you can put your data in. So let's use a data lake because that makes sense. We get our data in files and folders sometimes, so let's put it like that. So and then we have a compute layer at the top and a storage layer at the bottom. So what's the first thing we have to do? We have to extract our data from our data source. Um, and this is by far the most important thing of the whole talk. Please remember this if you don't remember anything else. You want to extract your data in its raw form. You don't want to take your data, put it into memory, take some features out of it and save that. You want to extract it in its raw form. Why is that important? Um, uh, I'll show you a bit later why that's important. Actually, I'll show you now. Um, let's say we're doing a web scraper and we're scraping a website and we, we want to get a little table out of that website. Imagine your scraping has failed or, and you're not aware of this, the, the, the scrape process has failed and you're saving some transformed, unraw uh, set of your data. You will never, and you realize later on, oh, there's a problem here. You will never be able to go back in time and get that data you've lost. By saving your data in its raw form and then transforming it afterwards, you're, you can then optimize your transformation process on your raw data set. So it becomes not just a t equals now problem, but a t equals over all of time problem that you're trying to optimize, which is what you want to have. Um, and then you want to do your transformation and load process really as one go. The fewer nodes that you have in your uh, pipeline, the better it is. You have fewer dependencies, fewer bugs crop up. Oh, this process didn't spin up versus this process didn't spin up. So this is a very good pipeline to have. Two nodes, you have an extract process that its only job is to extract the data and a transform and load process that transforms the data in memory and puts it into your database. Great. However, sometimes you might want to save your data on back into the data lake. Uh, for example, if you're using a schema on read database, that's what you have to do. Schema on read, you apply the schema on files and folders so it's read like a relational database. And then you load it on. However, this is not as good as the previous method for the points that I've already discussed. However, this is good, okay, it's fine. We get our data, it's somewhat fault tolerant, but it's not really checking data content. You, you have to understand that data vendors, they provide you data that has problems in it. And what your stakeholder wants is clean, good data that they can rely on. If I go to a supermarket, I shouldn't have to open up a tin can to see what's inside it. I should have the validity and the, the assurance that when I open it up, I will have tomatoes in there and I won't have something else. Or, few tomatoes or one tomato. That's a very bad product. We should start thinking of data as a product, not as some scientific academic thing. We just want to get it to work. What, what do our consumers actually want? So we should have validation in our data. As soon as you extract your data, you should validate your data over all, so X in this case is like your pipeline dimension and T is over all of time. You should have a validation function in your data. 
Uh, the second place, uh, if it fails that validation, you should put your data into an extract failed area into your data lake. So where you, as an individual, can have a look, oh, why is this program, why is this process actually failed? Look at it, inspect it, oh, this is the problem, fix my extraction, fix my validation, fix my transformation, whatever you need to do. You're not losing any data. Next thing what you should do is you shouldn't load data into your main table. You should load it into a staging table and then validate your data in your staging table before you give it to the consumer. The consumer is not querying the staging table, they're querying the main table. Let's be, let's be good engineers and check that, oh, this data is good enough, but we obviously won't manually do it. We'll write a SQL query that does it for us. And uh, before we give it to our consumer, we validate that the data is good to give it to them. And then you take it, append it, do whatever you need to attach it, left join, whatever, and it's added to the main table for it to be consumed. And then what else do we need? We need monitoring. If anything on this process fails, you should be alerted that this process has failed. And for what reason? So you can quickly go and be like, ah, oh, uh, this has failed. All right. So what is, what's the consequence of having a validation and a fail? Oh, by the way, I just want to show you something else on here. So if you notice, I haven't really put any specific technologies here. Uh, I haven't made any assumptions on what my stakeholder wants, on what the type of data it is that's coming in. I have cogs up here, which are my compute layer, and down here I have a data lake and a, uh, this is S3, but it doesn't really matter, you can use it what you want, and these are databases. So it's a, think of it as a framework you can apply in more or less any situation or for many different pipelines um, to get your data in. And you will be able to tune what these computational processes or the storage layers are depending on what your consumer wants and how quick you want your data and that all comes from them. Time. So what's the consequence of this validation that we've added? As time goes forward, uh, this is what we want to happen. We want our data to come in, trickle into our main table. We get it. Great. Yes. But let's say we've had a, if we added the validation, we'd have a validation failed area here. So our data comes in, it stops. We don't have anything. Or we can have a situation where it's validated this chunk, oh, that's failed, it continues to the next one, to the next one, to the next one. So you can set your pipeline up in a way that it completely stops, it doesn't let any more data come in until we fix that validation and let it go on, uh, uh, let it continue, or we fill up every single hole. Which one do we choose? Question, which one do we choose? It's a question for the audience. The middle one or the bottom one? Uh, who said that, sorry? Depends on the situation. Could you elaborate? Uh, if you're going to be doing some summarizing, it depends on the previous time period, but you don't want any data to load uh, until you fix the first time period. If it's just, um, you know, it's, it's, not, it's just if it's not going to do any summarizing, it's just going to compile the data and take some kind of gaps or some kind of data gaps. Yeah, great. So it really um, it's matters of how your consumer will be consuming that data. Uh, you should let them know through metadata that this table is going to have this is going to happen or this is going to happen. Um, so problems in your data are, in, are inherent, and that's something that you should understand. Uh, yes. Uh, so you load in your data and it goes forward, forward, forward. So here are some principles. Let's go through some principles of a uh, good data engineering pipeline. The most important one is understanding your data consumer or your consumer of your data and what they want, how fast do they want it, um, what questions are they trying to answer, uh, what do you optimize more than another or something else. Uh, then you should understand your data. Uh, how is, what the problems with your um, source data, what kind of format does it come in? Um, Keep your data in its raw form, very important. Uh, don't delete, delete or move your raw data. As soon as your, I'm gonna go on this side this time. As soon as your data uh, lands, lands, it should stay there forever. You've validated your data. You shouldn't be moving around. Uh, this not, S3, for example, has an HTTP location. You should all, that HTTP location should always exist for that data forever and ever and ever, as long as you want that data to be there, for it to be used. Um, Validate your extracted data before saving. You can't do that in every single opportunity. JDBC connections are quite difficult to validate if you're taking in some data, but it's something you can do. 
transform your data over time. Think of it as not just, oh, I'm going to transform this set, oh, I need to update to transform this set. Your transformation function should run over all of time for that pipeline. Um, that is really what you should be doing as an engineer. The only thing you should be doing as an engineer is optimizing that transformation function so it keeps on working. Why is that important? Like, why, why, why am I saying all this? It's because I can then have many, many products. I can scale out as much more if I reduce the maintenance of my pipelines. I can have this pipeline, that pipeline, that pipeline. I can use fewer data engineers to do the job of getting this large variety and volume of data. Separate out your extract and transform load processes for the reason I've already said. Minimize the number of data and compute nodes. Store all your data if practically, practically feasible to do so. Um, uh, this is an important point, and it's saying, and it's kind of in, somewhat invalidates the whole thing I'm trying to say. Uh, this says, if it's more, it's better, if your source data will always exist, and it's good, and you can rely on that, do none of this. Just take your data, query it, and put it into the database. If you, are, you can't rely on your source data existing for the whole time that your data product, whatever you're producing at the end is there, then you have to have an ETL process. Um, make your, your ETL acyclical. Your data should flow in one direction like uh, a river. It shouldn't join back onto itself back in time. Everything is going in one direction. Nothing is connecting back to itself. The directed acyclical graph. Uh, validate your data before it's given to its consumers. You want to have high trust in your consumer that the data is good. Uh, join your data at the database level. Don't join it before that. A database is created to, to, as a relationship between different data sets. So you should be doing all the join in the staging time period. Um, you shouldn't be joining anywhere before that. Uh, and monitor your data. Uh, you should monitor and understand how your flows of data are going. If something's breaking, um, John would be very upset if his product was no longer getting to London. Here comes John back into the equation. And this has a lot of connection with what John is trying to do. A data engineer, I would say the data at the moment is very much in the state of 1431. Um, data vendors do not know how to give you data in a reliable and clean manner. Either lack of experience or whatever, they don't think about these concepts. So you have to work like John. Uh, and this is the reason why I actually researched John. Um, he's actually an actual merchant in 1431 that I found. To understand how did he actually do his work in 1431 to get the product to its destination. So last thought I want to give to you is what I said before. Data as a product, and that's really the future of, of data and getting data, is I should, no, my consumer must be able to find that data without having to open up the product itself. The consumer shouldn't have to query the, the table uh, to see what's inside it. I should be able to say into Google or some search engine and say, this is what I want, aha, uh -huh, great, uh, this is where it is. And then I can have a recipe, or the, sorry, the consumer of the data can have a recipe, just like how you have um, on uh, tin cans at the back. Oh, you can do this and this. This is how you use it. This is fine. Um, great. This is exactly what I want as a consumer of data. Uh, my company is called Deep Data Intelligence. Um, we do training, advisory, and implementation. Uh, these are the resources uh, that I found. Um, have a look at them. Um, yes, that's everything. Thank you very much. Mm. Mm. Any mm. questions from the audience? Nothing. Do you have any examples of the off the shelf pipelines for which would do something like this for you? Off the shelf pipelines? Like to data lakes and that, that um, picture essentially. I can't think of any off-the-shelf pipelines that have to do it. I can say how I, I would do it, at least. Um, you, wanna, you want your data pipelines to be quite intelligent. So you want them to rerun a process if, if it's failed, for example, and try a few times. Um, I've normally, uh, the way that we do it is, 
make a tooling area for your different data sources, for example. Um, so, for example, you're only really going to work with databases. You should work with a database in the same way for any single database, really. Uh, SQL Alchemy, for example, if you want to get out, get out your data. Um, having validation tools that you can use in all these different steps. Uh, as something to monitor and do this kind of airflow, I'd consider working with airflow. I think that's a very good tool to use. Jenkins, if you want to go down to the Jenkins route as well. Um, yeah, data flow. Hmm? Question? So what is the time frame of something going from cloud into the main, what is the latency of data being available to for data models or consumers to be used? So let me, if I understand the question, what is the time for data going from its source to How its... How many times you're doing it? Is it happening in real time, this pipeline? Um, pipe? So yeah, all these could be triggering processes. You can design it if that's what you mean, right? So you can, that's up for you to decide how you want to decide. It's best to have a triggered process where one triggers the other process. I wouldn't do cron that much. I do cron for the initial source area. Um, how long it takes is depend, that's, that's the specifics of what your end user wants. You, you have to design that your, yourself around that. Best practice, how long? Triggering processes. I, I try to trigger as much of my jobs as possible. With a triggering process, then you can link your different nodes together. And I can say, like, I have this one bit of code up here, and that's triggered from that one. And then I can have a network graph to say, oh, this is all my, all my code that's working, and this is where it's failed, and this pipeline, this pipeline. You want to maintain your code as little as possible. So triggering is, is how I do it. Any other questions? Yeah. This is an example of a, a kind of an offline process where at the end of it, perhaps you'd have uh, a modeling data set, but how do you deal with the implementing the same in a, uh, in a kind of a real time uh, situation uh. And, and managing the two um, and making them equal? So could you elaborate on uh, in terms of offline online process? So you're receiving data from your um, sources, uh, extracting and saving it and then doing all of this transformation and loading mm -hmm. um, and then perhaps some more transformations after that but in a uh, in a real-time situation you'd want to do all those transformations on the source data instantly and have that available to your system mm -hmm. so these these are probably going to be batch jobs so how do you tackle the difference there if you're talking about streaming architectures and how how to work with that i haven't included it in this slide because, I'm, uh, because okay. So a streaming architecture, you can have one node, and then you have to do the validation on the fly as you get the data in. Make sure your streaming architecture allows you to do that validation step, really. Um, then you have to think of a smart way of how to validate before it goes into the main table, for example. Are you okay with just putting the data in straight into the main table with the streaming architecture? Uh, that's something. Is it okay? Is it okay? Do you need to be streaming as well? Uh, can I can I fill up my staging for a while and then do it as a batch process every minute? It, you just have to think of what errors could crop up. Um, streaming would be the the nicest way to go for it, but it just might be a bit more complicated in its implementation. Yeah. Yep. Hi. Um, let's say you've got your ETL set up. Can you elaborate a bit more on what you hope to achieve in your monitoring process? Yep. So uh, in my monitoring. I'm looking for, for two things. I'm looking for if a process has, stopped, has not worked or if my data validation uh, has failed. Think of it as just a unit test. I expect this output from this, for the validation at least, and it's not happened. I want that to be given straight. I, I want it first to try and do it intelligently and retry. But if it fails, you need to tell the data engineer, oh, there's some, there's some problem here. Please go investigate as quickly as possible. And you have an SLA with your stakeholder how quickly you need to do that. Um, so that's where the monitoring part comes in. Yeah. Yeah. So, for example, uh, imagine your uh, main table has uh, a number of IDs. Uh, this only exists in the main one, and then I'm getting new data in with some new IDs. Um, rather than querying that, uh, that oh, I didn't include something there. Um, 
So in your staging one, you can check whether those IDs exist in the main table rather than doing it at your extract location. I should have actually included another bit where if the staging fails, sorry, the data goes into a, uh, a failed staging area and then your data is, uh, then you get the monitoring back on that. If that makes sense. So like if, uh, oh, sorry, I have to project, so that's yeah, fine. Sorry. Um, but if you have, say, like, if you're dealing with price data and there's a restatement like a week later, do you have sequential reloads or like what are you doing to actually validate that something's always going to be this particular level? So if I understand what you're saying is you're getting some pricing data and the price is incorrect and how are you validating the price is incorrect? Um, how would you validate in that particular system that the price is correct or not? Oh, I'm, I'm just saying that, like, let's say you load a price, yep. and when you load it, it passes all of your validation, it's correct, yep. and then the actual thing changes, like, a week later. Okay. So how, how would you change your framework, or, like, what would you do in that, like, do you, I assume you do this in practice, right? Yeah. Yeah, so how would you build something around data that you know is likely to change at some point in time in the future? Well, if your data is changing at some point in the future, it's still going to be... So, for example, the price has changed, staging table, um, you can... Uh, remove the values from your main table or create a new table uh, from that. If, if that price is a certain ID for a certain product um, and it's given a new price, you do that at the staging location. Uh, do a left join on that and replace the values that you want to do. Does that answer the question? Yeah? Okay. Okay. I think that's everything. Ooh, uh, big hand for Gaddis. Thank you very much. <laughs>